Hello brothers and sisters Christ, welcome to part two of, um, make sure I name it right, Are You Looking uh, Doctrine, Sound Doctrine, part two. Make sure you've watched part one before you come to part two. Make sure you, you keep up with the series. But this whole thing is just about we're going through the Bible. Why is it so important? Why is it the final authority? But like I said, we're using scripture. So if you don't believe that there's a final authority, th these videos aren't going to mean nothing to them. But to you and me, brother, sis, Christ, God's word means everything to us. So this is going to mean something to us. So we're going to catch up where we left off. We're in part two. So we're going to start talking about God's word has promises in it. Okay? We talked, just a cap for the part one, we talked about the authority of, uh, that you have the spoken word, capital W word, lowercase w word. Okay? The name of Jesus matters more than the word of God. We looked at that and said, no, the word of God is elevated above his name. His word's above his name. And if it wasn't for a perfect written word of God, you can easily get duped by a false Jesus, false gospel, uh, false doctrine, if you don't have a perfect written word of God. Okay? Why is God's word so important? We talked about that in part one. God's word has power. Okay, God's word is able to save. God's word has the power to change one's life. The new birth. Now we're at God's word has promises in it. Why is this so important that we have a final authority? Okay, God's word has promises in it. Make sure to pause the video and turn because we've got so many scriptures. I'm trying to keep it down to under two hours. If I turned to every single one, we'd be here for four or five hours. Okay. So pause the video and turn, and then unpause the video. I use the space bar when I watch uh, brethren do Bible studies. Okay. So 1 Corinthians 10.13, 1 Corinthians 10.13, God's Word has promises in it. Remember, there's tons of promises in it. I'm just grabbing a few that God put on my heart for this video, and it's to encourage you, brothers and sisters, Christ, to go even further than what I've gone and delve into these subject matters of all these different things that the Bible has that makes it so important, it's the Word of God. Okay? It's got promises in it. 1 Corinthians 10.13, we read, There hath no... There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, faithful, it's a promise, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. That's a promise. Anytime temptation, this flesh starts whispering. I had an email from a brother in Christ. Sometimes I just hear these words telling me to do this. To... Sometimes your flesh is going to try to whisper to your soul saying, Hey, that's okay. Or that's okay. You're going to have the lost world pressuring you to do things that you're not supposed to. And temptation. Okay? Where are the temptations coming from? God will open doors to get you out. This is number one. Get to reading the Bible. Get to doing Bible studies. Prayer. Go for a walk. Stay busy with your hands. God opens doors. Physical work that pleases God. Working in the garden. Working around the house. If you have a job to go to, um, I'm just throwing things that God's blessed me with. i got a garden God blessed me with. A uh, chicken coop to take care of chickens. Um, this house i got to take care of. This property i got to take care of. There's uh, Within a, a ten minute drive, there's, a, there's ocean, there's beach. Okay, I can go find some back beaches and go for a walk and have some solitude with my flashcards, my memory verse cards, the Word of God. And I go for a walk and I talk with them. If it's pouring down rain and temptation's getting strong, I've got videos where I just jump in the truck and go. I get away from the temptation. Okay, and I go to, even if it's raining, I go to, there's a place in town where I can park by the wharf. And there's a place by, by the ocean where I can park and I can roll down the window and you can hear the ocean crashing and I'll play Alexander Scorvey and I will just sit out there for two or three hours listening to Alexander Scorvey getting away from temptation. Okay, But this is a promise that God gives us through His Word. Okay, It's written down. You know how people say there's a contract? If it's just word of mouth, it used to be word of mouth was important, but you needed it actually written down and signed. It has to be in contract form for it to be binding. Here's your contract form. This is binding. God gave us his promises in a perfect written word, and it comes to you today in the form of the King James Bible for English-speaking people. This is God's perfect written word. It has promises. That's why it's so important. Remember we talked about this. Are you elevating it? In your life, does this take? 
Is this number one? Is it up here? Number one? Or is it starting to be number two? You got something else in the way. Number three? Number four? Is it sitting over there gathering dust? One of the reasons you need to be open in this and staying in this every morning, every night, is because there are promises that God gives us in there. That's one promise. That when we get tempted as a saved sinner, God will open doors for us. And the biggest open door is grab your Bible and start reading when you get tempted. Start singing hymns when you get tempted. Start praying and talking to the Lord about it. Go for a walk. First okay. um, John 1.9 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I threw that last verse in there because as saved sinners, we're still sinners. But we're saved sinners. We still struggle with sin. We still struggle with this body of flesh. We're only two-thirds redeemed. Our soul and our spirit's redeemed, but this body of flesh isn't. And when we get caught up, this body of flesh is going to become no more. And when the Bible, we're going to read this, when, uh, the, this mortal must put on immortality, this corruption must put on incorruption, it still has to go by the wayside. This body of wicked flesh. Okay. Uh, we're still sinners. But one of his promises is, is, you fail the Lord, you come back to him in a broken state with true repentance, true sorrow in your heart for that sin, saying, Lord, we always tell brothers and sisters Christ that, oh, I did this, and I what do I do? I did this, and I shouldn't have done it. Repent, forsake, and get back to your walk with the Lord. Get back to living to the Lord, for the Lord every day. Repent, forsake, he will forgive you. And he'll get you back up on your feet and get you back going in the right direction. It's one of his promises. We read it. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all, all, all unrighteousness. There's some brethren that doubt their salvation because they fall back into a hole. They try to resurrect the old man. They make mistakes. And some of them are big mistakes that makes you just brings them crashing down. Their whole world just comes crashing down to their knees. And they've made a huge mistake. And then they start wondering if they were saved to begin with. God, you can't lose your salvation if God truly saved you. It's not your salvation, it's God's salvation. But when God saves you, you are saved. How do we know that? Ephesians 4.30. Turn to Ephesians 4.30. Here's another promise. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That's a promise. When God saves you, He seals you. Until the catching away of the body of Christ. You're sealed until the day of redemption. You can fail the Lord a lot. There's some, I believe there's some brethren out there, brothers says Christ, that they're not amounting to much for the Lord and their life is just a complete wreck and they're, they're miserable. Why? Because they're having a hard time hiding this in their heart and living it. They're having a hard time letting go of this world. They make bad decisions and they continue making, they don't learn from their mistakes. Okay? They're not amounting to much for the Lord. Remember what the Bible said? Uh, we talked about this in another verse. I think it was, um, I think it was Romans or, or, or Corinthians where Paul's talking about how some, God knows them that are His and there are some to honor and some to dishonor. There's some, there's go, in, my, in God's house, there is gold and silver, wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. Okay, I've failed the Lord sometimes in my life as a Christian, as a Bible-believing, God-fearing um, uh, brother and sister in Christ, part of the Church of God. I have failed the Lord sometimes. And there's been a few times in my walk with the Lord that I failed Him big time. Sometimes I've failed the brethren. All right. God will forgive us. It's a promise. God has sealed me. I, when you get saved, newly saved, I can see doubting your salvation a little bit because your life is a complete mess and God's got a lot of work to do. But you should get to a point where you don't doubt your salvation anymore, period. Because God gave His promise to you. Trust the Lord. You believe in His Word. He says you are sealed into the day of redemption. Stop doubting your salvation and start repenting and forsaking and getting your heart right with the Lord. Notice I said heart right. And the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in thy heart that I might not sin against thee. There's a lot of Bible verses I've been coming across lately that talks about, especially in Psalms, 
I'm going through Psalms right now, that talks about a heart issue. It's a heart issue. It's the heart. It's the heart. It's the heart. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is where the where repentance happens. Not up here. Here. You repent, you forsake, and you get back to living for the Lord. Okay. But that's a promise. He'll open doors when you're tempted. He'll uh, and you're sealed into the day of redemption. So that even if you fail to go through that door and you fall, God will pick you back up. Okay. I don't have this in my notes, but one of the pro promises also is chastisement. That God will chastise you as a father would a child to get you back on the right path. That's a good thing. At the time, I always tell people, I fear the chastening. But once it happens, I thank God with all my heart for it. It gets me back on the right path. It gets me living for the Lord. It gets me back to pleasing the Lord. Absolutely. That's another promise. That's some, some promises people are like, well, I don't know if I like that. But I do. I fear it. I don't look for it. I don't just say, chastise me. I fear the chastisement of the Lord. I fear God. When I do wrong, I fear God. But when He does chastise me because I've done wrong to get me back on the right path, I praise the Lord for that chastisement. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.15. Here we have another promise. I went ahead and put two of them together because this is a big promise and lately this is our biggest hope and promise that God gives that we're looking for. The whole point of this study, if you're truly looking for Jesus Christ, that blessed hope, and you have your eyes on Jesus Christ and you believe that He could come back any day now and you're, with the life that you're living, you're looking for it every day with the life you're living, How? what place does this book take in your life? Is this number one priority? Or is it the 15th? The 20th? The 30th? It just sets on the, like I say, sets on the, sets on the shelf or a table somewhere gathering dust. Where do you spend most of your time, brothers and sisters of Christ? Well, I forgot that verse exactly, so please, it's not right, but it talks about how where you spend the most of your time, there, there your heart is. Where are you spending most of your time? If you're spending most of your time in the Word of God, that's where your heart's going to be. If you're spending most of your time in the world and worldliness, that's where your heart's going to be. Right. Just throwing that out there real quick. But God has promises. That's what makes this so important that you need to lift it up. One of the things is God, this word, shows us all the promises God gave. God gave the Jews promises. He gave Abraham a promise. Covenant with Abraham. He's given promises to King David. You can read about the promises that God gives to mankind, and then when you rightly divide... You'll find out that we have promises for us today, too. And I'm reading some of them. 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of our Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which... Are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a comfort. This promise is a comfort. We see how bad it's getting out there, brothers of Christ, and we're like, Lord, please come soon. Oh, Lord, I'm looking for you, Lord. I know this isn't it. How bad it's getting down here, dealing with this flesh, failing you, uh, doing right by pleasing you, failing you, pleasing you, failing. It's just like, you know, you're having a hard time in your struggles and your walk with the Lord. And you're getting so sick and tired of this flesh. We have a promise that this world isn't it. This life, I mean, this life is not it. We're not going to spend eternity in this wicked body of flesh. Now, right there, I've always taught that that's talking about the catching up, okay? In the sense that it doesn't talk about the moment in the twinkling of an eye. This is talking about, uh, I believe we're going to go up, like clouds are going to form under our feet, the dead in Christ go up first, and even if there's no clouds in the sky, by the time the dead in Christ go up first, there will be clouds in the sky. Then we, we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds, to be with them in the air, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I believe that event's not going to be, we just poof, we're up in, we're up in heaven. No, it's going to be an event where the world's going to see people going up. They're going to see it. Okay? But what's this moment, the twinkling of an eye? We have, there, this is one promise, we're going up. Here's another promise that coincides with that promise. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 52. 
Here's what we got in a moment. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That's what happens in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This body of corruption, all of a sudden I have an incorruptible body. One minute I'm sitting here like this, and I don't know, I'm not saying this is exactly how it happens, but one minute you see me sitting here like this, and then boom, I'm standing with white garment on, and a perfect body, an incorruptible body. That's what happens in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Not being caught up. People need to rightly divide. All right? And read the scriptures. Dead shall raise incorruptible, we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption. It's a promise. And this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same as written, Death is swallowed up in victory. We don't have to put up with this body of flesh for, the rest, for all eternity. Oh no. Okay. It's a promise. Brothers and sisters of Christ, this book has promises in it. And if we don't have a perfect written record, how can you trust those promises? The lost world is still fighting back on some of the videos I put out on Bible version issue videos, and they're still fighting back. Oh, the 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 heresy of King James onlyism. Uh, no, we have a doctrine of there's a perfect written word, there's a perfect written record, there's a final authority, and it's not mankind. It's the Lord God Almighty and His perfect written word. And we've already talked about this, go watch part one. God spoke His word through His Son, Jesus Christ. God the Father spoke through His Son, Jesus Christ. So you have the capital W word, and God the Father speaks through His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, where it talks about how men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And you're not to take it as the words of men. You're to take it as the Word of God. The Word of God. If there's no perfect written record, how are we supposed to trust the promises that God gives us? I believe that this book is perfect. And brothers and sisters in Christ, a lot of you that are watching, I believe that you believe this is perfect. So we have precious promises in here that we need to keep reminding ourselves about. We need to stay in this and read it every day. That's what it means to be looking for that blessed hope. Treating this book, holding it up here, and treating it like it's perfect, because it is. It's God's perfect written word, and we need to hide it in our hearts, and we need to be living it. Okay. The word of God tells us the history of, this, of his creation, and it tells us of his future. We find that. This is, some people say it's a history book. It is. It does talk about history. It does. Okay. But it talks about God dealing with mankind throughout history, starting all the way from the beginning where God creates the heavens and the earth. God creates Adam and Eve. Okay. Okay. It tells us different events throughout the whole world. Like I said, this proves that the world, if you believe in this, and I believe in it, the world's only like six, seven thousand years old. Not millions and billions and billions of years old. This is a history book that goes all the way back to the beginning of creation, the beginning of time. Right. Turn to 2 Peter 2.5. It tells us about a big event that happened. 2 Peter 2.5. I grabbed these two events because they're more uh, relatable to today. But I've been listening to the Old Testament, the Kings. Like I said, I'm on Psalms now, but I went through 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. I uh, went through ne uh, uh, Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls. And then... Ezra, Ezra. Ezra is rebuilding the temple, and Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall. Okay, these are things that have happened in history. Okay, it tells us the history of God, the world that God created. 2 Peter 2 5, one of the biggest events that happened in the past that it tells us about. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. This tells us about Noah and the flood. How wicked the world got, and God destroyed the world with the flood and saved Noah, his wife, his three sons, and his three sons' wife. Eight people in an ark. And you can read about it in here. This tells us about the, the, the past. It talks about Adam and Eve and the fall of Adam and Eve. How sin entered into the world. How now we're born in the likeness of Adam. Right? 
Adam was created in the, uh, I'm sorry, we're created in the likeness of God. We're now in the image of Adam. Adam was created in the image of God. Perfect man. Jesus Christ is a perfect man. Okay. I don't want to go into that too much, but some people get on to me because I say that Eve wasn't made in the image of God. She was made in the likeness of God. God is not equally masculine feminine. He's not man and woman. He's a man. Okay, Adam was made in the image. Image is something you can see. It's physical. It's just talking about the body. But I want to, I've already talked about this in other studies. Adam and Eve were made in the likeness of God. But Adam was made in the image. And when Adam had his first son, it says that that son was made in the image of Adam. Adam. Okay. We are in a fallen state. We have to deal with this wicked body of flesh. But this is a history book. It tells us the history of everything that happened. Okay. When God comes across uh, Abraham, pulls him out from the world and says, I'm going to make you a people and gives him a promise, a covenant. This is a history book. It tells us about the past. It tells us about, about Jesus Christ. It tells us about Nebuchadnezzar. And the Jews failing the Lord and going into captivity to Nebuchadnezzar, I think it was for 80, 85 years. I can't remember the actual length of the, the punishment. Um, but this is a history book. Okay? It tells us about the past, or the past. And we can learn. That's why the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We can learn from the mistakes that people had in the past. We can Okay, but you're not going to find doctrine in the past. You're going to find doctrine in the Pauline epistles. We already talked about that. Um, but it's a history book. That, the reason I grabbed that about the flood is because the world got so wicked at one time that God destroyed the world with a flood and saved eight people out of it. Guess what? The world is getting that wicked again. And God will destroy the world again, but it won't be with the flood. He made a promise. There's another promise that could be could put under the promise. The rainbow. Okay? The sick, perverted, wicked world tries to take that rainbow and misuse it. The sodomites. And they're trying to flash to God saying, See, you can't flood us again. See, you can't flood us again. Oh, I won't be flooding you. God's like, I'm not going to be flooding. If you knew my word, if they knew the word, he's not going to be flooding you with, with water. It's going to be with fire. Next time he destroys the world, it's going to be with fire. Okay. Revelation 9, 1. Turn to Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star far fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun of the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts, Upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. But only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. And those men are the Jews, 144,000 Jews that have a seal in their forehead. Not uh, the church. Okay, the church doesn't go through the time of Jacob's trouble. But there's going to be a time after we get caught up. Remember one of the promises, we get caught up. And everyone that gets left behind has to go through seven years called the time of Jacob's trouble. Also called Daniel's 70th week. But the time of Jacob's trouble is God's going back to dealing with Israel. But this tells us the future. Okay? And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months and their torment was of the torment of the scorpion when it strikes a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. It's going to be a dark, dark time. Okay? The oceans are going to be turning to blood. Okay? There's going to be a lot of uh, miracles working. Remember, the Bible says working of miracles, not just miracles, working of miracles. I believe working of miracles was there at the, in Acts, the transition, when they were still trying to preach the kingdom of God. And the working of miracles got put off. That's not for today. Okay, there's no man that can stand there and call fire down from heaven. That's a working of miracle that can turn the oceans to blood. That's a working of a miracle. Okay, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, the two witnesses are going to be there, Elijah and Moses. And those are the two, it's, it's, 
it's, it's interesting that those are the two people that did that God worked through the most and performed the most miracles through in the Bible. And they're coming back in the time of Jacob's trouble. Those miracles are coming back. God's going to be pouring out His wrath on this world to wake up the Jews. And the Bible tells us all about it in Revelation. It tells us about the future. Uh, another thing about tells us about the future is that uh, in the last days, in the last days, it talks about there's going to be a falling away in the last days. It's warning us. Okay? It talks to us about the man of sin, the son of perdition. It talks about us in that time period um, the mark of the beast. It gives us a little the hint on that, okay? So this book is a history book. It lets us know the history of God's creation. From the very beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Getting all the way to Revelation where it talks about there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. A new Jerusalem coming down. Okay. It's a history book. It's so important that if you believe this, then you can't be deceived. If there's no perfect written word that we have that tells us about the history of man and how God's dealt with man, then you can easily be deceived by the wicked world. I mean, they're trying to throw out evolution. Oh, we've been here for billions and billions of years. Uh, no, I have a perfect written record here that shows we've only been here for six to 7,000 years. Not billions of years. You're a liar. Well, this, this happened in the past. I got a perfect written record. You're lying. The whole point of taking the perfect written record away is so we can be easily deceived. And brethren, when you put this down and it starts gathering dust, I've seen brethren fall away and get deceived. Why? Because they don't know this book like you should know this book, and you're not hiding in your heart. When you think you've got this book in your heart and everything's okay, and you go to put this down, you need to grab this and start all over. I listen to Alexander Scorey from Genesis to Revelation. And when you get to the end, it's like, oh, I did it, I'm done. No, nope. start back over in Genesis again. You really hurt yourself when you put down this book because you think you've got it all figured out and everything's all... Uh, you need to keep hiding this in your heart. You need to keep refreshing your heart. Refreshing your memory. You need to keep reading this. You need to keep staying into it. Why? It keeps the world from trying to dupe you. You know why a lot of professing, professing Christians out there get deceived so easily? Because this is not their final authority. They're not hiding this in their heart. They don't know God's perfect written word like they should know it. And they get duped for Bible perversions. And their Bible perversions are like, they just have it set in there when the guy up there is, t is preaching. And they're just sitting there. They flip it open and then they sit there. The guy just says, turn here once, maybe twice, and then goes on tangents and everything. It's like, And then they just sit there. And this, when they're not at the Bible buildings, it sets that their Bible perversions just most of the time just sit there and gather dust. Because they're taught it's not the final authority. So they don't treat it as such. They're easy to be duped. They're easy to be deceived. Brother and sister Christ, I'm teaching you this is the final authority, not this, this. And if this is your final authority, you're staying in it every day, and you're hiding it in your heart, it is going to be so hard for someone to come along and deceive you. It is. This is a history book. Okay. God has promises in it, and it's a history book that tells the truth about our history, mankind's history. The Word of God tells us more about our Creator. Oh, here's a good one. Uh, turn to John 4.28. John 4.28. You mean this lets us know about our Creator? Let's us get closer to God, and God reveals more and more of Himself through the Word of God, through His Word? Today it's all about experiences and, and flesh highs and you know you go to these some of these battle buildings for flesh highs and everything and it's like you're putting on you're just feeding your flesh and it's one big roller coaster ride and it's I'm experiencing God. No they're not. No they're not. You want to experience God, this is how you do it. God will reveal himself through his word. And he'll draw you closer to him and let you know more about him and who he is through his word. John chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit, capital S, spirit, and they that worship him must 
worship Him in spirit and in truth. God has a spirit called the Holy Spirit. It's also called the Comforter. Okay. The Bible says whatever He hears, when it talks about the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whatever He hears, that shall He speak. God the Father speaks to us through His Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Romans chapter 1, verse 17 for there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God, known of God, is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. He's given us a perfect written record. Why do people keep rejecting it? We'll get to that part. For God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly, being, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without, without excuse. This book tells us that God has a body, his son, Jesus Christ. He had a body at the very beginning. He has a body in the, throughout eternity. This Bible tells us our God has a spirit. Capital S Spirit is a refer reference to the Holy Ghost. This tells us that our God, the Bible tells us that our God has love for His creation. Our God is a vengeful God. Our God has wrath. Our God is righteous. Our God is tr just. He is true. Our God is a saving God. He can save. Our God can destroy. Our God is slow to anger. This book tells us about the God that I serve. It opens up because he wants us to know a little bit more about him. We're not going to know everything about God. Great is the mystery of godliness. Okay? We're not going to know everything about God. But God likes to let us, know, let, us, let us in a little bit here and there and show us who he is and what he wants for us. Okay? This book helps you to get closer to God, having a perfect written record. And the people that claim to be close to God, they're close to their flesh. They're close to worldliness. They're closer more to Satan and that Antichrist spirit and these Babel buildings, especially the Charismatics. Okay? You want to be close to God, this is how you do it. You study the Word, you hide it in your heart, and you live it. And God reveals to you who He is through His Word. And if there's no perfect written Word of God, A, you can't prove that you love Him. Okay, you can't, the promises mean nothing. Because who knows if they were true or not. I do. I have a perfect written record. And when this says God is not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance, I believe it. That's my God. That's my capital R rock. Okay. Notice this Christ. God's word is the final authority. Okay. The final authority. We're going to bring it back down. Everything we talked about that the Bible has, God's word is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Let's turn to Psalms 119, verse 160. We've gone through a lot of things. God's Word is the final authority. And if you don't have God's Word, and it's not your final authority, it's going to show. We can see it with all these fakes and frauds out there, professing to be Christians. But Jesus is not shining through them, and the Antichrist spirit is shining through them. They look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world. They're all about the flesh. Remember Romans chapter 8? Carnally minded, walking after the flesh. That's the mark of someone who's lost. Someone comes to you, I'm a Christian just like you are, and they're carnally minded, walking after the flesh. They are false. 100% false. Someone who's truly saved is going to be capital S spiritually minded, walking after the capital S spirit. You're going to struggle. You're going to fail the Lord sometimes. But your heartfelt desire is for the Lord and let, saying, Lord, you're in charge. Okay? Open the scriptures to me through the Holy Spirit. You're in charge. You command. I obey. A lot of these folk, fake people out there, religious people out there, their flesh is in charge. They're worldly. Okay? 
Psalms 119, 160, we read, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Thy word is true from the very beginning, Genesis, all the way to Revelation. God's perfect written word. And I, like I said, I deal with some people, do you want God's perfect written word? No. And we're going to get into why people don't want God's perfect written word. But right now we're talking about that this is God's perfect written word, and it's the final authority. Luke 4.36, turn to Luke 4.36. Luke 4.36. Okay. We read, And they were all amazed, and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirit, and they come out. The Bible talks about that with Jesus Christ, the capital W word, where God the Father is speaking through his Son, Jesus Christ, to the people. He says, that, what is this? This man is, speaks with authority and not as the scribes. The scribes are, yea, hath God said. The scribes are all about doubt, all about confusion. But Jesus spoke with authority. Why? Because God the Father was speaking through him. His word, when he spoke, it was God speaking. It was the word of God being spoken. Right? With authority and power. Turn to Revelation 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things... God shall add unto them the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, doctrinally, here's the thing. Doctrinally, I believe this is for the time of Jacob's trouble. When Revelation's going to be very important, that book's going to be so important for those going through the time of Jacob's trouble. If you add to or subtract from, these things are going to happen. But remember, we can go all throughout the Bible for instruction in righteousness. There's something to learn from this. We're not to add to God's word or subtract from it. Verse 20, He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. Talk about when he comes back before the day of the Lord. He actually comes back. All right. But it says there, we're not to add to or subtract from this book, the book of Revelation, but the book of Revelation is God's word. You say, well, if it's just Revelation, that doesn't mean anywhere else. Uh, Proverbs, turn to Proverbs 30, verse 6. We're commanded, period, not to add to God's word, period. But there's going to be a huge consequence for adding to God's word in the time of Jacob's trouble. Huge consequence. Proverbs 30, verse 6. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. That's why we have a perfect written word record. When they come along, we can look at them and go, you're lying. Oh, you can lose your salvation. The Bible says you can't in this dispensation, what's called the time of the Gentiles, the church age. You're a liar. Oh, the Trinity and the Godhead are the same thing. And they preach their, their pagan trinity, and we look at the Bible and go, uh, you're a liar. The Godhead is God and the person of Jesus Christ. Your pagan trinity is, is, is going to be a lower, because it's all false gods. Lowercase g God and three lowercase g gods. So you've got four lowercase g gods. It's God's plural. That's, that, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's a lie. Oh, the church goes through the time of Jacob's trouble. I have a perfect rec record saying we will not be going through the time of Jacob's trouble. We're going to be caught up before it. You're a liar. You're a deceiver. There were some old men, uh, how do you call it, country bumpkins, if you want to call it, that had the King James Bible. And when you had these more progressive preachers trying to come around with these Bible perversions, they'd be able to look at them, and they don't have much intelligence. They didn't go to college or school. They, they could barely read the Bible. And they would be like, uh, that's not what the Bible says. That man's a liar. You don't need a PhD or THD or doctorate or anything like that. You just need to have a love for this book, Brother Sis Christ. It's the final authority. Okay? And if we don't have a final authority, how can you tell if someone's adding to or subtracting? Why even warn us, you know, not to add to or subtract from his word if there's no final authority, if there's no perfect written word of God today? We've talked about this in the other study, that heaven and earth shall pass away. In part one, 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. God promised to preserve his word. Okay? We're not to add to, we're not to subtract from. If you don't have a perfect written word, how can you tell? Those people out there being deceived left and right, they can't tell because they don't have a final authority. They don't have a perfect written word of God. It's available to them, but they reject it. They hold the truth in their unrighteousness. They know it. They're, they're going to be held accountable for it. I have, I have no doubt that one time when they stand before Jesus, if they, don't, if they don't get saved before they die, truly saved and born again before they die, they're going to be standing at the, judge, at the great white throne, and they're going to be answering to Jesus, and Jesus is going to be look at all these people that tried to show you the truth. Here's the King James Bible, God's perfect written word. Here's the true plan of salvation out of it. And you rejected it. Because you wanted your Bible perversions that you're being told, you don't have to treat it as the final authority, because it isn't the final authority. You're the final authority. You get to shop around and pick whatever book you want, and you get to shop around for whatever Bible building you want that tells you what you want to hear. Brother and Christ, when I got saved, God saved me, it was through the Bible version issue. Okay? And then I was taught, I, I heard the gospel out of the, of the King James Bible, and then I went and searched the Bible. It was, a, it, was, it was different than what I've ever been taught. I was a false convert. And I was like, where are they getting this gospel? I did the Bible version issue study. Hardcore. Hardcore. And I came to a point where I said at the very beginning, I know a fraction of this book. I knew the gospel. And I, I, I said, I know some of the stories of the Old Testament, but I know a fraction of this book. But I came to it saying, this is God's perfect written word. I believe it. Lord, show me the truth. Whether I want it or not, I, I want the truth, but I'm saying whether I like it or not. I'm trying to say it in a way that's like, that I came to this saying, this is perfect. And whatever we come across in here, if it means i got to conform to this book, I will conform to this book. The lost world doesn't want to conform to the book. That's why they look for books and then they don't treat them as the final authority because they don't want to conform to God's word. They don't want to treat the real Jesus Christ as capital K King and capital, K, capital L Lord. They don't. They want to be the capital K King. They want to be the capital L Lord. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Psalms 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. That's how important it is. It's been purified seven times. And if you look at the, and I'm going to do a suggestion here towards the end of this video about uh, watching some videos that have to do with the Bible version issue and the history of the Bible and everything. Okay? God went through a process where they were trying to make Bibles, um, transcribe Bibles from the Greek and the Hebrew, and it went through a process, okay? Seven times. When it got to the King James Bible, God's done. He's got a perfect written word in English. It's good. Here you go. Okay, here you go. But thy words of the Lord are pure words. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters in Christ? I do. Now, in words, you can say, I believe this, but in deeds, do you believe it? If you believe these words are pure words, the silver tried in the fire purified seven times, are you hiding these words in your heart and doing your best to live them? And any time you fail the Lord, you repent, you forsake, and you get back to hiding God's word in your heart, you get back to your walk with the Lord. Or is it just words? I'm, I want to be part of this Bible-believing group, so I'm just going to say it in words so I can be part of this group. But your life shows that you're no different from the lost world. Is that what's going on? Some of you that are saved, that I believe are saved, is your life, are you starting to backslide to the point where you're starting to look like the lost world? And this has lost its preeminent place and it's starting to drop. You need to get back to this, especially in these last days, brothers and Christ, especially in the last days. You know what's going to get us through these last days? The Word of God. By all means, if you want to store up some food for a year, I do. I always store up food for a year. All right. You want to store up food for a year? Fine. But don't fall into the trap of being a hardcore prepper and thinking that's going to save you and get you through these hard times. No, no, it isn't. It's the Word of God, His precious promises. All right. It's the Word of God that's going to get us through, brothers and sisters of Christ. Proverbs 35, uh, I'm sorry, Proverbs 30, verse 5. Chapter 30, verse 5. 
Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. He's a shield. He will defend us in hard times. Oh, yeah. He'll be there for us. He'll provide for us. Okay? So, brothers and sisters of Christ, uh, turn to Psalms 119, 140. Okay? Psalms 119, verse 140. Brothers and sisters of Christ, this is the final authority. It says, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. You know, one of the things, you can get someone who's newly saved, and he can be a wreck on the outside, and God's just now starting to work on him, but you can see in him, or her, the love that they have for God's word. You see that thing that you have in your life? The Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. <gasps> I need to get that out of my life. Their attitude. It could still be a messed up life, and God's just now working on their life, but their heart for this book and their love for this book. Oh, this book says I need to do this. I'm going to start doing it. This book says I need to get this out. You can see that love, even though their life still needs cleaning up. You can see that love for God's Word. Right now, the, the, the problem I'm having with some of the brethren that are backsliding is you show the scriptures to them that says what you're doing there is wrong. Their attitude isn't, oh, I love the word of God, and if it says it's wrong, I need to get it out of my life. Their attitude is, is, who are you to judge me? You're not qualified to be talking to me about the word of God, and so on and so forth. And they get mad at you. And you're starting to say, what happened? The fire, the, the light, remember, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. The light that's in them is, is dying down. The word that's supposed to be in them, that light is dying down. Okay? And I'm dealing with some brethren like that. And I look in the mirror, first person, anytime, I'm, I tell this as an, uh, as an encouragement to the body of Christ. Men in ministry, myself, and brother, brothers and sisters of Christ, period. Before you go to somebody else to talk to them in correction or rebuke, you make sure you look at yourself first, every time. You might say, well, I'm not doing that. Look at your own life. Say, okay, do I have other things that I'm doing wrong? Am I struggling? Okay, I don't want to come across as a hypocrite. Okay. That always try to evaluate yourself first in your walk with the Lord before you go and, and pray about it and stay in the Word before you go talk to somebody to correct them and make sure you're correcting them through the Scriptures. You're doing it with love. You're doing it with the intent to build them back up. Not destroy them, but build them back up. And meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Okay. But this is the final authority, brothers and sisters of Christ. It's the final authority. The world doesn't want that. And some of the brethren are starting to backslide, and they're not treating this book like it's the final authority, God's Word. Traditions of men are coming in and becoming the final authority. Covetousness, which is idolatry, is starting to come in and become the final authority. The flesh is trying to talk to you, and you're trying to treat the flesh as the final authority. There are brethren out there that are becoming respecter of persons, and that man behind the pulpit, that man behind the camera, I'm pointing at me, <laughs> it looks like I'm pointing at you, but I'm looking at the little camera up there, I'm pointing at me, the man behind the camera, and you're starting to treat that man as he's the final authority. He's not. I'm not. This book, God's perfect written word, is the final authority. When I line up with it, it's because I'm following it. It's not because I'm right. It's because God's Word's right. And where I'm wrong, it's because I'm not following this book. That's how it works, Brother Jesus Christ. But there's a lot of you that are starting to treat men behind the camera, like on, on you know channels like YouTube, Rumble, uh, BitChute, that kind of stuff. And there's brethren out there that are treating men in battle buildings behind the pulpit as if they're the final authority. And when they know, and when they know that man's wrong, they'll keep quiet. They'll keep their yap shut because he's the final authority, not the Word of God. No, the Word of God needs to be your final authority. Okay? If you're going to correct somebody, like this, I'll use me. If you're going to come correct me, you do it the Bible way. Right? I've had a lot of brethren try to come correct me with hate, bitterness, Pride and ego, name calling, mocking, that's not how you correct somebody. But evidently it's it's very very popular in the online in the in the body of Christ right now. That's how you correct people. No, it is not. You correct people through the word. And you do it with meekness, with a, with the right authority, the um, final authority. 
You do it in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You don't do it out of anger. You don't do it out of pride. You speak with authority. But you do it in meekness. And your intent is to get that brother back on the right path. Get him, build him back up and get him going again. That's the whole point of correction. If you don't really want them to be corrected and you really don't want them doing what's right, what's the point of saying anything? There's no point in saying anything. But I'm starting to go off a little bit on the rabbit trail. This is the final authority that you correct brethren with. This. And do it out of meekness. Thy word is pure words, therefore thy servant loveth it. Do you loveth God's word? When someone comes to you to correct you with God's word, as the final authority. Do you humble yourself? I've had brethren correct me where I still don't believe I was wrong, but I humbled myself. I looked in the scriptures again and said, you know what? I, I, I'm sorry, Lord, but I, I need to, not sorry, Lord, but I'm sorry to that brother that I need to stick to your word and stick with what is right. Then there's times people have corrected me and I humble myself and I read the scriptures. You know what? That brother of Christ is right. I'll call this out. This isn't the white one that we did, but when I was showing out this new Bible, the big one that I was excited about, because I really like it. Um, I had a white one here, it's Gideon, and it was actually the New King James. And it, I didn't grab it from that box that I have all my Bibles, I grabbed it from another pile because I just wanted a small book to do the sizes. And then I found this one that was actually in my cabinet that I showed the picture of, and this one is Gideon also, but it's a King James. And what I found out during the history is that the King James, or the Gideons, started out putting out King James. And over time, they fell for the new King James. And they used to put Bibles in hotels and everything that were King James Bibles, and then they replaced them all with new King James, and now a lot of them have NIVs. They fell away. So when you see the symbol there, I don't know if you can see it, but when you see the symbol, I had a brother warn me about it, and I had to give him, I don't do hearts, uh, hardly ever. I just give a thumbs up, that's great, that's great. I gave him a heart because that white book was actually a new King James. It was a perverted thing. He corrected me. I could have been like, who are you to correct me? Go somewhere else. I can get all prideful and puffed up. I'm the man of God. No, when he corrected me and said, you need to watch out. It's a, it has a, it's a Gideon Bible. They, have Bible. they use Bible perversions. He's talking about present tense. And yes, present tense. They use Bible perversions. And I was like, really? I grabbed it, I opened it up, I started doing checks on certain verses and everything. It's like, you know what? This is a new King James, the white one. And I threw it in the burn barrel. This is a, this is a Gideon, but it's, it actually is a King James Bible, God's perfect written word. But the point is, is he went to correct me, and this is, this is to me, this is not that big of a correction. It is to keep, uh, keep me true to the word of God, but this was an easy correction. The hard correction is if I was doing something I love, my flesh loves, and he comes to correct me and says, what you're doing there is wrong, you need to get it out of your life. Those are the hard corrections to take. But we still need to humble ourselves, and we need to take correction, but make sure it lines up that they're using Scripture to correct you, the King James Bible. But I was corrected by this. And I thank that brother and sister, that brother in Christ, sorry, I thank that brother in Christ because I don't want, I've only got one perversion in my house. And it's a Dewey Reams, and I use it as a visual aid to show this was their first Bible. It came from, I have a book there that's like even before the Nestle's Alon. But it's the Greek uh, New Testament, West Cotton Hort. And I use them as visual aids when I talk about uh, the Bible history. You know, the history of the Bible. Okay. I don't want any other Bible perversions in my market up. This is a Bible perversion, Satanic Bible, so that if... I get caught up and someone comes here, they find nothing but stuff that will point them in the right direction. The perfect written word of God. Or books on the perfect written word of God. Okay. First uh, Corinthians 3.18 says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. Remember what the Bible says? That God has made foolish the wisdom of this world? Do you know why people, men want to be, I'm getting ahead of myself, want to be wise? They don't want this to be the final authority. They want you worshiping the man behind the pulpit. He wants to be the final authority. Why? And so they can be glorified. And if you read that passage further down, it says that no flesh should be glorified in his presence. Why has God made foolish the wisdom of this world? To tear man down and put men in their place. 
God is so far up here and we are down here. We're to give God glory. We're to give God thanks. But some men like to get the thanks and they like to get the glory. I did this and I did that and you need to listen to me and, and, and so, uh, oh yeah. Let him become a fool that he may be wise. You've got to come to the point of saying, the wisdom of this world is worthless. Lord, the wisdom of this world is worthless. I want your wisdom, Lord. Show me your wisdom. That's the only way you can become wise. Is by dumping all the junk, take, take, taking all the junk out of your heart, and start filling it with the truth, God's wisdom. 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and again the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Why do people don't want this book? Because they want to have all the authority. Starting at the, the man behind the pulpit, all the way down to the person who's sitting in the pew. They all want to have authority of one shape or form. They all want to have authority. They don't want God having full authority. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, I have it turned right here. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3, we read, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. That's why we keep saying, they keep telling us, that, telling you, brothers and Christ, if you're a King James Bible believer, and your, your belief is that there is a final authority, that you worship this piece of paper with ink on it. No, 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 no. Bibles fall apart. Okay, Bibles can be burned. If you've watched some of the history on the, on the people trying to get the Word of God out there, those Bibles were burned. This Bible, the words that are on this ink, means nothing if you're not putting it here and living it. This Bible sitting there somewhere gathering dust means nothing. It is nothing if you don't hide it in your heart and preach it and live it. Preach it and live it. Not just preach it and then live a, a wicked, worldly life. Preach it and live it. They both need to be one and the same. Right? And it's hiding in your heart. We see that. Fleshly tables of the heart. I've always said this, Brother Jesus Christ. It always comes back to a heart issue. It always comes back to a heart issue. It's not a head issue. Wisdom of this world? Uh, it's a heart issue. Hiding God's wisdom in your heart. Right? Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 17, we read... For ye are not as many which corrupt, corrupt the word of God. But as sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. You mean there's people that corrupt the word of God? Absolutely. Okay? They don't want God to be the final authority in their life. They don't want his word to be the final authority in his life. We read about that. He elevates his word above his name. They love the name Jesus, but they hate his word. That's not the sign of someone who's truly saved and born again. Turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 29. Here's where we get the verse I said earlier. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 29. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes like to tear down the authority of God and make themselves the authority and make you reliant on them. But why do people not want God's Word to be the final authority? Well, you have a group of people that they don't want God's Word to be the final authority. The um, scholars, the scribes, okay, because they want to be the final authority. John 12, 43. And when they get to be the final authority, this is where we get to John chapter 12, verse 43. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. You have men that like to lord over the laity. They like the praise of men. They like them glorifying them, praising them, lifting them up, not the word of God up, not lifting God up, and praising God, them. They want you dependent on them. And that's what the Catholic Church, when I mentioned some of the videos you should watch, um, that's what the Catholic Church did. 
They wanted the laity to rely on them. They didn't want the Word of God out there. They didn't want the common man to have the Word of God. They wanted to be the final authority. And they could be the boss and tell people what to do and, and have that power hungriness. Oh, yeah. So you have that group. But that appeals to people. Look at them. They have all this power and authority. That appeals to the lady, too, that if there's no final authority, then I can have the final, then I can have this power, too. That appeals to people. Okay? Especially when they correct the King James Bible. When, if there's no flaws in it, there's no mistakes in it. Every attack, like I said, every attack on this book, <clears throat> I might not have all the answers, but there are men out there, Bible-believing, God-fearing men out there, that have answered every attack on this book. And like I said, lately what's been happening is, is you get them coming back and they're rewording the same attack that's already been answered. And the number one thing they do, brothers and sisters of Christ, uh, turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. It says this, when you have so, because I'm getting ahead of myself, when you have someone that lords over the flock, that lords over the flock, Revelation 2, it says, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. That's what the Nicolaitans were. They lorded over the flock. Revelation 2, 15, go down, it says, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. What is that? There is no perfect written word of God. There's, the final authority is not the Lord and his word. The final authority is the man speaking. The man that jumps up there and says, I'm the one in charge. You guys are all laity. You're too dumb to understand the word of God. You need to come through me. Okay. And one of the things, brothers and Christ, that they do is they like to pray, pray on the ignorance of people. And I'm serious. Those Bible perversions, there's only very few people I've ever come across that really studied their book. Like they have an NIV. I came across one guy, had an NIV. He believed that was God's perfect written word, and he actually studied it. But if he actually had the Holy Spirit in him, he would see that, hey, this contradicts with this, this contradicts with this. this it's just it's one big mess. It tears down the deity of Jesus Christ here, 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 here. It's a, it's a Bible perversion. But most of the time, most, and I'm only going off his words. Maybe he didn't study it. Maybe he just reads it. Remember, the Bible didn't say, read to show thyself approved unto God. Reading this book isn't good enough. The Bible says, 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, study. Maybe he didn't really study. He, he missed, uh, missed he mistaken study for reading because I tell people, make sure that you're studying your Bible by reading it. That's No, you study your Bible by comparing Scripture with Scripture, rightly dividing, okay, and applying it to your life, putting it in your heart and living it. But most of them that use these Bible perversions don't even know what's in their book that they're holding in their hands. They don't study it because they're taught it's not, <clears throat> it's not the final authority. It's not the final authority. Just trust the man that's talking behind that pulpit there or behind the camera. Just t take him at his word. That's why a lot of us, brothers and Christ, in these last days, Bible-believing, God-fearing men in ministry are telling you to have your Bibles open and follow along. And after you're finished the study, start doing some studies for yourself. Not just reading, but studies for yourself. Okay? But you have that group of people why don't they want it? Because they want to be the final authority. I'm sorry, I have sore, uh, dry throat. <clears throat> they want to be the final authority. Okay? Turn to Genesis 3.1. Then you've got the rest of the people. Okay? The ones that are following them, but the reason they like following people like that is because if there's no final authority... That guy could be wrong. I can still be the final authority. What was the first per, uh, I say person, but the serpent. What did the serpent try to promise Eve? Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more subtle than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. God's not the final authority. Question God. Question God. Don't trust him. Don't believe it. Don't hide it in your heart. Yea, as God said. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. 
And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, touch it lest ye die. She added to God's word already. It just, it seems that with man, this is before the fall, but God didn't say you couldn't touch it. He said don't eat it. Now don't get me wrong, it's better just not to touch it, not to be around it. I wouldn't have been around it, I wouldn't have touched it, I wouldn't have had anything to do with it to keep me from failing the Lord. Now, that's what we got to do with things around here in this world. Their temptations, everyone's got their um, addictions, their temptations. You need to stay away from it, have nothing to do with it, don't touch it, don't be around it, nothing. Right? But God said, don't eat of it. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He is called God a liar. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye shall be as gods. You're, you'll be the final authority. God just doesn't want you to be the final He's trying to hinder you, you know, he doesn't want you to be the, the greatest that you can be. All these lies that Satan's given. God was protecting him. As long as they were in the garden, eating from the tree of life, and staying away from the tree of the knowledge of good, of good and evil, they had eternal life. What happened after they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? They did die. They lost that eternal life. They started to age. And Adam ended up dying. 933, I think it is. Eve ended up dying. Verse 6. And after they ate from the tree, I want to throw this in the two, that God had to kill animals. Blood had to be shed to cover their sins. The sin of eating from that tree. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she went over and looked at it. The servant got her to go over and look at it. Like I said, stay away from it. Had nothing to do with it. No, he got her to go over and look at it. Food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, I can be my own final authority. She took off the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the number one reason, I'm telling you, everyone I've ever dealt with, the number one re people, especially these pastors that really love their Bible perversion, their Catholic Bibles. I'm not Catholic, but they love their Catholic Bibles. They want to be the final authority. That's what it's all about. There is no perfect written word of God. You can use whatever book you want, but I like this book, so I'm going to preach from this book. If it can be any book, how come they don't take turns preaching from different Bible perversions? Why does the pastor always pick one that he likes and that's the only book he preaches from? Predominantly. Because it's all about him being the final authority. Okay? And then what happens to the laity? If you notice that if you're in... Because I was in a Bible building where the preacher predominantly loved the NIV. And he preached from the NIV. And if you looked at the people, they predominantly had an NIV. Out of all the Bible versions, they tend to... They, they tend to Follow, ooh, ah, oh, that man, he, want, he prefers an NIV, therefore we must prefer, pre prefer it. They won't take time to actually do the Bible version issue study for themselves. And that man that's standing behind the pulpit, more, more than likely, he won't teach it. He'll just lie to people. Don't listen to these people, it's a lie. There is no perfect written word of God today. You know, they're just liars. It comes down to mankind as a whole wants to be their own final authority, brother, sister, Christ. Brother, sister, are we supposed to be that way? No. We have a final authority, brother, sister, Christ. It's this. Does it show in your life? What place does this book take? I'm going to keep coming back to it. What place does this book have in your life? I've talked to neighbors that profess to be Christians. I tried talking to them about the Bible version issue. I told them I was like you at one time. I was a false Christian. I had five to six Bible perversions. I went to a Bible college for a year, okay? And I was just as lost as you are until God brought me to the truth. Let me tell you about the, the, the Bible version issue. This is what led me to the true plan of salvation. This is what got me truly saved. They don't want this book. 
They don't want this book. And I have no doubt their hirelings behind the pulpit probably told them to stay away from me a lot, the few neighbors that I have. And they still talk to me in passing, but mankind wants to be their own final authority. They do. That's why you've got this false gospel of easy believism. That's why you've got the false doctrine that there is no perfect written word of God today, no final authority in written form. So they can be the final authority. So you mentioned the false gospel. Yeah, the easy believism. I just say a little prayer, I'm in, and then I get to decide how I still want to live my life. Looking like the world, acting like the world, laughing at the world's jokes. The Bible says, be conformed, be not conformed to this world, need to be transformed by, I'm sorry, be not conformed to this world, but be renewed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But they have the easy believism, they love conforming to this world. They love the ways of this world. Why? Because this isn't their final authority. The world is. You will not find easy believism in this book. You will not find faith alone in this book. You'll find repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And after salvation, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old, the, behold, all things have, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It talks about how the old man is dead with Christ and the new man is raised with Christ. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're not supposed to be like the, the world anymore. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. When I did that study on fun, you know, fun is flesh, a lot of these easy believisms got mad. Why? Because they love the world more than they love the Lord. The Bible has their number. Lovers of, of pleasures more than lovers of God. You guys remember that verse? Maybe you're new, you don't. You can look up that verse, but it talks about how these false converts, they have a love of God, but their love for the world is more. And that's why they're going to hell, to burn, because they love the world more than they love God. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Can you love a pizza? Yes. I love pizza. It's one of my things I love to go do, an old uh, stove place that does the old uh, wood stove pizzas. I'll grab one and go set by the water and watch the boats fish up and down the stream right as it goes out to the ocean. Um, I love pizzas, but I don't love it more than I love the Lord. If I had to give up pizzas so I could hold this Bible, I can't see how that would happen, but keep this Bible, I'll keep the Bible. If I have to give up the house for the Bible, fine. Give up all this stuff for the Bible, fine. If I have to lose a wife because I'm holding the Bible first and I'm choosing God first and loving God first, that's hard. If I have to lose a daughter because I chose the Word of God first and this comes first and God comes first because I love God more than I love them. You see how that goes? It's not saying you can't love them. I love them. I have to say loved my, I, lost, I lost my daughter. Okay. Um, loved. I loved them, but I wasn't going to compromise. I wasn't going to become like the world and looking like the world, acting like the world. I wasn't going to compromise my walk with the Lord. And that pushed my daughter away because she was going the way of the world before she passed away. Before I lost my, my wife, went the way of the world, committed adultery, and I did a written divorce. This, brother, sister, Christ, brother, the lost world, they want to be their final authority. This is our final authority. Is this so precious to you that you're willing to lose anything and everything as long as I get to hold on to this, Lord? This is what matters most to me in my life. This is number one in my life. Or is that uh, living your dream life number one? Oh, yeah. Family members, number one. Me, myself, and I, number one. Fleshly things, number one. Drunkenness. Drug addict. My ex-wife was a, drug, a drunkard and a drug addict. And she was very fleshly. Got out of control. Me, I had to start asking the Lord, when I told you, brothers and sisters, Christ, 
I'm getting very serious. <laughs> There's no one in here, but it sounds like it feels like it's getting quiet in here because it's serious. I told you when I newly got saved, there were certain things I had a hard time giving up. Hollywood movies, TV shows. I'm pointing at my computer. Hollywood movies because you, nowadays you can do it all on the computer. Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. And God had to smack me around and get me to the point where he's like, is this more important? Is God, he's like, God's telling me, am I, talking about God, is, am I more important to you, Philip, than that filth and that wickedness? Like I said, he had to smack me upside the head, and, and I didn't get the, rid of that stuff overnight. It took time, and it was only by the grace of God that he got it out of my life. <coughs> You have to make a decision, brother, says Christ. This or the world. This or the world. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to lie to you. Choosing this, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. It'll cost you your children sometimes. Your children are going to grow up. You can raise them in the admonition of the Lord. Praise God. You can raise them right. But they get to a point where they have to make their own decision. Is this going to be their final, if they're going to get saved and this is their final authority? Or are they going to go the way of the world? And if they go the way of the world, you're going to have to choose this over them. Okay. Family, wives, husbands, whatever. We're in the last days. People are falling away from, from the truth that they once stood for. And there's a lot of fakes and frauds out there. And there's a lot of just flat out uh, Christ rejecting wicked people out there and everything that's going on around us is this is the only thing that's going to get you through are you going to hold on to this you're going to stand for this no waver don't faint the bible talks about don't faint don't falter stand 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 the bible talks about second corinthians 4 1 people want to be the final authority and they're trying to get you, brother, sister, Christ, to compromise, compromise, compromise. Don't do it. Truly looking for Jesus Christ and His coming, which could happen any day now, looking for that blessed hope, is making sure that you're keeping this Bible, this Word of God, the King James Bible, is the final authority in your life in all matters of faith and practice. You're hiding it in your heart and you're living it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Faint not. Don't falter. Stand, 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 stand. Verse 2. But having renounced the hidden, hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. You have people out there doing that. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Why? Because they don't want a final authority. The lost world doesn't want a final authority. They don't want God to be in charge. They want their flesh to be in charge. They don't want to put the flesh down. Elevate God's word and put the flesh down. They want their flesh to be in charge. So no matter how much we try to preach to some people, Paul already had their number, and he's talking to the Corinthians, the ones that are supposed to be carnal Christians, and we already just debunked that. There's no such thing as a carnal Christian. There are Christians that are backsliding. There are Christians that are really making a mess of things and not amounting to much to the Lord. But there's always that struggle, there's always that conviction, and there's always chastisement from the Lord. If you're truly saved. Romans 8 says, to be carnally minded is to be the enemy of God. I'm sorry, the, uh, the carnally minded and walking after the flesh, and that they are in the flesh can't please God. Those who are saved are capital S spiritually minded and walking after the spirit. If the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. You know, Satan, yea, hath God said. He's got his his ministers of, remember his, his no moral that his ministers are also transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. They don't have the blood of Jesus Christ washing their sins away. It's going to be based on their works. 
judged at the great white throne, they're being judged according to the Levitical laws. The law of sin and death. Okay? Satan, yea, hath God said, and through his ministers, yea, hath God said, hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. If you believe that this is God's perfect written word, and the gospel that's in it, it's going to find you. Okay, and it found me. I knew that God, the true plan of salvation, but it didn't reach here until I got to a point where this is God's perfect written word. Thy words are true from the very beginning. All of it's perfect. This is God's perfect written word. Then it started hit, Then the gospel was able to hit home. And then I fell on my knees before the Lord in a repentant state, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. God manifest in the flesh. It was God's blood, God the Father's blood that was shed on the cross. I confessed both in prayer and I asked, begged God to save me. I don't deserve it. Okay. But the world, they don't want a final authority. Satan's able to deceive them. The lowercase g God of this world is Satan. Hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, where do we find it? In here, in the King James Bible. Who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The image of God. Jesus is the body of God the Father. The image of God should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. But Jesus Christ, I'm your servant. I'm trying to get you to get this book and get back into this book and keep reading this book and keep hiding this book, the words in this book in your heart and keep living them. Jesus could come back any day. Let no man steal thy crown. There's some brethren that have turned their back on looking present tense for that blessed hope and they're trying to steal your crown. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to catch you falling flat on your face. I don't want the Lord to come back and find me falling flat on my face. There's plenty of times I have failed him and fallen flat on my face. I don't want to come back finding me flat on my face. And the only way I'm going to be able to be in a standing position is if this takes the number one priority in my life. And I'm hiding it in my heart and I'm living it. And the same goes for you, brothers and sisters in Christ. The lost world, the lowercase g God of this world, has blinded the minds that believe not. They don't believe in the perfect written word of God. They don't believe in the gospel, the true plan of salvation that's found in this book. Like I said, you won't find faith alone in this book. You won't find easy believism in this book. You have to come broken before the Lord as a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell. And you look at God and say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm going to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. But I want you to know, Lord, I am so sorry for sinning against you. I'm so sorry about my state. I'm just so sorry, Lord. They like to take that out because they don't want to get saved. They don't want, because that leads, after salvation, that leads to a changed life. Your attitude towards sin is, I hate sin, I hate wickedness, I hate the flesh, this body of flesh. Not hating it as far as being able to walk, I'm grateful to be able to walk. I'm talking about the temptation of the flesh where it tries to get you to do things that go against God's word. They don't want that. Why? Because this is a final authority, and they want to be the final authority. This says that we're supposed to be spiritually minded, walking after the capitalist spirit. Jesus talks about sending the comforter, and he'll guide you into all truth. Open the scriptures to us. Help us to live a life of Christ, not a life of the flesh, not a life of the world, not a life of whoever that man's name is standing behind the pulpit or behind the camera. We're supposed to be living a life of Christ. Okay. John 8, 47. John chapter 8, 47, we read, He that is of God heareth God's words. He that is not of God, or so ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. The Lord case ye has God has blinded the minds of them that believe not. You have the Holy Spirit in you. He's going to bring you to this book. You're going to hold on to the book, and you're going to cling to this book. And over time, if you don't keep this book at the right predominant place in your life, 
hiding in your heart constantly every day, you're going to start backsliding to that person that didn't take this Bible seriously. Because there was a time where I didn't take the Word of God seriously as a professing Christian. I was a false convert. You don't want to fall back to that. You don't want Jesus coming back and finding you flat on your face. Not looking for Him. Okay? But they that of God hear God's words. Back then, when, it's, when you talked about hearing somebody, you can listen. Have you ever heard the saying, you, you're listening, but you're not hearing me? You're listening. Yeah, he's talking. Yeah, he's talking. I'm listening. I know he's talking. But you're not hearing me. If you actually hear what someone has to say, you take the heart and you apply it. Okay? They that of God heareth God's words. They take it in and they apply it to their life. Okay. You therefore hear them not because you're not of God. They don't want to apply God's word to their life. They want to live how they want to live. That's not supposed to be us, brothers and Christ. That's not supposed to be us. Covetousness comes in and becomes idolatry, lowercase g gods, and things start getting in the way of this book and start taking a place above this book. Family members. Me, myself, and I can come before this book. Fleshly things, temptation, sin, uh, uh, addictions can start trying to come back in. You keep them down and you keep this as the priority. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word is men, but as is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You know why the people attack this book and say it's just the words of men? Because they don't want it to effectually worketh also in you that believe. They don't want you taking this and hiding it in your heart and living it. They don't, Satan doesn't want the world doing this. Catholicism doesn't want the world doing this. And you know what? Your flesh tends to try to agree with them. Because your flesh, that you have to put down all the time, doesn't want you doing this. Doesn't. Okay. Once again, like I said, to someone who's lost, this message that we've been talking about won't mean anything. But you know what? This message isn't for them. This message is for my brothers and sisters in Christ out there that are starting to waver. This message is for my brothers and sisters in Christ out there that are standing firm, that you remain standing. Don't start becoming one of the ones that are wavering. This word is God's perfect written word, and if you're reading it every day, you're studying it, you're hiding it in your heart, and you're doing your best to live for it every, every day, and that means you're looking for that. That's one of the markers if you're looking for that blessed hope. That you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. It helps you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. And let every one of you that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Notice Paul talking to Timothy saying, Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ Christ, not Jesus, not church, church of the living God, uh, not brother, not sister in Christ, not brother in Christ, saved sinner, born again. He said Christ, you know, like Christian. I might get some slack from some of the brethren because they don't like the word Christian anymore, but it's a Bible word. Let them that name the name Christ depart from iniquity. How do you know they're false and fake? The world as a whole loves to name the name Christ, but they don't want to depart from iniquity. They love to call themselves a Christian, but they don't want to depart from iniquity. See, Paul has their number. Let them that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Then if you don't want to depart from iniquity, stop calling yourself a Christian. But that's not going to work. They're going to always keep trying to call themselves a Christian. They want to be the final authority, brothers of Christ. They want to be the final authority. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5.17 we read, Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. They don't want that. We did, brothers of Christ. Don't forget that. 
Why do we preach the gospel to people that are saved? Why did Paul preach the gospel to Corinthians, to professing brethren? People that were naming the name of Christ? To remind you why you got saved, who it is that saved you, and who it is you serve. And there's some brethren out there in ministry that have forgotten that. They've forgotten it. And they're starting to go the way of the world. Right? I, like I said, the first person, before I make that accusation, the first thing I do is I check myself and say, Lord, am I doing that? Am I feeling you that way? Make sure you're always checking yourself first before you help out a brother or sister in Christ. But we see that, okay? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. The lost world doesn't want that. We did. What happens when you start backsliding and start trying to resurrect the old man? You go back to having that attitude of, you don't want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. You don't want to be spiritually minded and walking after the Spirit. You kind of like you know, the old man. The way things kind of were. But here's the thing. If you're truly saved, and I've got... People that have, brethren, that have testimony after testimony after testimony. If you're truly saved and born again, you realize that when you try to go back, you're so miserable, you've lost your peace, you've lost your joy, you just feel worthless. In other words, you realize you can't go back if you're truly saved and born again. You can try and make yourself miserable. You can try and wreck your walk with the Lord. But you can never truly go back. That's never going to be the same. Why? Because you were saved and born again and bought with a price. You came with that attitude that I didn't like, because your heart, I don't, your heart's desire, I don't like this sin. I hate this sin. But you're given into the flesh. And you start trying to resurrect the old man, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be completely miserable. Romans 6, 1. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? This easy believism. Oh, you can sin all you want. Just put, put it on my tab. They got mad when I said, Oh, just whip Jesus a few more times. It's okay. Just Because when you keep sinning as a, as a professing Christian, what you're saying is, is, Oh, he didn't get whipped enough times. He didn't bleed enough. Oh, there's still some of his beard there that needs to get ripped out. When you have the attitude of just, Oh, I'll put it on my tab. Oh, God will forgive you. It's no big deal. Sin is still a big deal for me, brother, says Christ, and it should be for you. I didn't say that sin was drowning my life. I'm drowning my life in sin. I'm talking about sin itself is still a big issue. We're still fighting sin as a saved sinner through Jesus Christ, through His Word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Sin is still a big issue. It's a big deal. Sin doesn't all of a sudden just become okay now that I'm saved. But with the easy believism, that's how they act. Remember, their words and their, their, a lot of time their words and their deeds never line up. They'll be like, oh yeah, sin is still a big issue. But their actions make it out like sin's not a big deal anymore. Who are you to judge me? I'm saved. I am a Christian. And they even some of them, I'm of the church of the living God. I'm of the church. They like to steal all our titles, all the names in here. I'm a brother and sister in Christ. Who are you to judge me? Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Paul's like, God forbid. Anyone who's truly saved, that's not our attitude. We don't have the attitude that sin's not a big deal. We need to get that sin out of our life. It doesn't please God. And it hinders us and puts, it puts a wall between, our, between us and the Lord. And it hinders our walk with the Lord. We need to get it out. I want my walk with the Lord to be strong. I want to be going in the right direction. I want to please my Lord and Savior. Sin doesn't please Him. Verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? The old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ. Therefore we are buried with Him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, a new life. The world as a whole doesn't want a new life. They love the life they have. They're on their way to hell, and they love it. They don't love the consequence of hell. Some of them don't like the consequence. But they love their life, and they won't give it up. Are we to send the grace may abound? No. Brothers, this Christ, don't be resurrecting the old man. 
But the lost world, why do they hate the, uh, the, us having a final authority? Because this book right here has a zero tolerance for sin. Period. Right? Zero tolerance for sin. You come to the Lord, you repent, you forsake, and you get your heart back right with the Lord. This Bible talks about how our sins can be forgiven. How you can get truly saved and born again. And as a saved sinner, how God can still forgive your sins as a saved sinner. You come to Him. Lord, I'm sorry I failed you again. Lord, please forgive me. And He'll forgive you. But God still has a zero tolerance for sin. How do we know that? Because it still needs to be forgiven. Okay? The ultimate consequence of sin is forgiven when you get saved. You are not going to go to hell. You're not going to be cast into the lake of fire. But you still have to answer for your life at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit because we're going to talk about a little bit about that. But you're still going to have to answer for your life. The good and the bad. The good works, the bad works. Things that pleased God and sin that didn't please God. You're still going to have to answer for it someday. Okay. Hebrews 11.25 we read, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy pleasures of sin for a season. Like I said, there's a cost. There's a cost to getting saved. Or, I'm sorry, not getting saved. I said it wrong. Forgive me, brothers of Christ. There's a cost to being saved. There's a cost to living the life of Christ. There's a cost to put, taking this word, hiding in your heart, and living it in this wicked world today. There's a cost. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Paul was beaten a lot. He was stoned once. I believe he was stoned to death, but it says he was stoned once, thrown outside the city and left for dead. And he got back up. God raised him back up. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. Okay. He was smacked around by his own people. The Jewish people, he was imprisoned by Gentiles. Preaching the truth and standing for the truth is going to cost you. The lost world doesn't like that. Philippians 3.17 Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be, follow, be followers together of me and mark them which, you, which walk so you have us for an example. Okay, there's nothing wrong with some ministries lining, looking a little bit like another ministry if there was a mentor. Or if they're following that ministry and that ministry, they got saved through that ministry and they start doing some of the things that that ministry does. Don't let other brethren try to tear you down. Okay, brethren that get into ministry and some of the things you do kind of line up with what they, they're supposed to. Brothers, they're supposed to. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which, which walk so you have us for an example. Why? Verse 18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. Like I said, they're heading for hell. And they love their life too much that they're living. That uh, Sometimes I say they love, they love the fact that they're going to hell. But some will say, I don't want to go to hell, but I ain't giving up my life that I'm living. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. They're flesh driven. They're carnally minded walking after the flesh. No such thing as, a, as, a, as an actual saved sinner that's carnally minded and walking after the flesh all the time. Nope. That's the mark of someone who's lost. Whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame. They should be ashamed of their sin. That's how you come to God broken. I'm ashamed of this wicked flesh. I'm ashamed of this person right here, Lord. I'm so filthy. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. On my way to hell, I deserve to go to hell, Lord. I, I'm ashamed of my condition. But they're glorifying that condition. The lost world does. So does a lot of the professing religious and Christian people out there. They glorify their shame. Who mind earthly things. They themselves are the final authority, and it's about the world. Worldliness. This isn't their final authority. Brothers and sisters of Christ, we're supposed to set the examples for others to follow. Okay? Please, 
Don't let people try to get to you. Oh, you're trying to just copy him. If he is going, if he's doing right according to the Bible, and he's living a good life according to the scriptures, and you say, I want a life like his, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay? There's nothing wrong with it. Paul's like, we're setting an example. You want to be like me? I'm setting an example. And he was an example to Timothy, to Titus, to Silas. All right? And some others. All right? But brothers says Christ, they don't want a perfect written word of God because they don't want the new life. They don't want the new birth. Okay? They love the flesh. It's all about being flesh driven. That's not supposed to be us, brothers says Christ. We wanted to change life. What place does this book take in your life? Are you starting to look and act like the lost world? And how you treat this book? Is it gathering dust? Do you go several days without reading the book? And hiding it in your heart? I'm just asking. So you guys will check yourselves, just as I checked myself. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Here we go for Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Thank you for... There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the capital S, Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus never sinned. He's not a sinner. He took on the sins of the world on the cross. And he can only do that because he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemn sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit that changed life. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. What did we just read in Philippians 3.19? Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and who glorify whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. They mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit do the things of the Spirit. For, the carn for to be carnally minded is death. It leads to hell. It leads to the lake of fire. Is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And like I said, when you start trying to resurrect the, you start giving into the flesh, and you start resurrecting, letting the flesh resurrect the old man, that, you just seem like you don't have a life, and that peace is taken, and that joy is taken. You can lose that. You can lose your joy. You can lose your peace. You can lose your testimony. When the lost world sees you trying to act like them, instead of being a light for Jesus Christ to the world. Spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity with God, against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Why were we created, brothers and sisters Christ? For thy pleasure we are and were created, the Bible says. We were created to please God. But if you're in the flesh, you can't please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the capital S spirit. That's the difference between someone who's saved and someone who's lost. But ye are not in the flesh. The flesh isn't in charge and the flesh doesn't run you. It can deceive you and it can talk you into things sometimes that you shouldn't do. But after you've done them, you fall on your knees and say, Lord, forgive me. I shouldn't have done that. Have mercy on me. Repent, forsake, and you get your heart right with the Lord. But you are not run by the flesh. The flesh doesn't control you. It's not the boss when you get saved. That's how you can tell the difference between these false converts out there. Their flesh is the boss, it's in charge, and it's running them. They're carnally minded and walking after the flesh. And one of the deceptions is, is you can be a carnal Christian. No, you cannot. This right here condemns that teaching. You cannot be a carnal Christian. You can be a, capital, a, a spiritually minded walking after the spirit. And name the name of Christ, and do your best to depart from iniquity, and sometimes you fail the Lord. Sometimes you backslide, sometimes you fall on your face. But your flesh is not in charge. And it says here, um, subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. 
if you're uh, carnally minded. 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so, that, if so, be, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. In other words, that's evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. You're not carnally minded and walking after the flesh anymore. You struggle with the flesh. You fight the flesh. You're putting down the flesh because it likes to be in charge. But it's no longer allowed to be in charge. This shows us an example of someone who has the Holy Spirit and shows an example of someone who's a false convert who claims to be saved when they're not. If so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You can, the big lie deception today is that, oh, these people have no evidence of the Holy Spirit. And the evidence of the Holy Spirit isn't speaking in tongues for today. Okay, it's not miraculous healing, working of miracles. Okay, evidence of the Holy Spirit in you is a changed life. God's, what's their attitude towards this book? What are their attitude towards the commands that are in this book? Are they living them? Are they obeying them? That's the true evidence that someone has the Holy Spirit in them for today. That's the true evidence. Okay. The number one reason for rejecting the King James Bible as God's perfect written word is because they want to be the final authority. I'll say it again. They want to be the final authority. They love their they want glory in their shame. They're they're fleshly minded. Right? They love their life the way it is. The easy believers in people, they love their life the way it is. Nothing needs to change, but they want to go to heaven when they die. So I'll just believe in my head and be part of this easy believism. And therefore, I get to go to heaven and continue living my life the way it is. They're on their way to hell. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, behold the truth, and unrighteousness, and have pleasure in unrighteousness. They don't want God to be the final authority in their life. They do not want to change how they are living their life, and who they are living their life for. They don't want this to be the final authority, and they don't want Jesus to be the one they are living for. They want to live for this person, me, myself, and I. That's why they hate the fact that they don't want a final authority, and they attack the fact that we have a perfect Bible. You ever notice how they try to they tell us that they try to take away your perfect Bible? If I can say it right, they try to take away your perfect Bible, and they don't offer any perfect replacement. And they want you to get rid of your perfect Bible for all these Bible perversions. They're just stricken with errors. They're so satanic and wicked. Full of lies. But they won't give us a perfect replacement. So instead of them conforming to God's word, remember, they want to be the final authority and they want to serve themselves. So instead of conforming to God's word, they corrupt God's word and get it to conform to the life that they present tense live. This is called a false convert. Okay? Um, or they'll reject God outright. So you have people who reject Jesus Christ outright, they want nothing to do with Jesus Christ, and then you have the false converts that, well, oh, I want to go to heaven when I die, but I don't want to conform to God's word. I don't want God being the, the Lord of my life, the King, King of kings and Lord of lords in my life. I don't want to live my life for Him. I want to live my life for the flesh and the world. Remember 2 Corinthians 2.17 for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God in sincerity, but of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. We're not as many as corrupt the word of God. Brother, sister Christ, you need to be keep to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and look for that blessed hope is to keep this book up here. It's the final authority in your life, brother, sister Christ. I can't push that enough. It's the final authority. You're hiding it in your heart. This is the standard. God commands you obey. And you don't care what the cost is when it comes to this world. You lose family members. You lose friends. You lose wives. You lose children, family members, wives, children, family members, mothers, fathers, best friends. Okay, you might even have to suffer affliction. Okay, you might lose a job because you're standing for this. 
Okay? You might be imprisoned because you're standing for this and hiding in your heart and living it. You might be beaten. You might be burned at the stake. You might lose your life because you're standing for it. There's a cost. But today we're in the falling away and a lot of people are starting to compromise. And they're starting to corrupt the Word of God to justify the world and how they're living because their living doesn't line up with this book. God's Word is the final authority whether you are standing before Him in the judgment seat of, uh, the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne. God's Word is the final word. Is the final authority. I'm sorry. God's word is the final authority. Romans 14, 11 we read, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone has to answer to Jesus Christ, who will be speaking, and when he speaks, it's God speaking through him, so therefore it's the word of God. Everyone has to answer to him someday. Whether you believe this is God's perfect written word or you don't. Brother says Christ, we get to answer to him at the judgment seat of Christ. Like I said, sin is very serious in our life. We want it out of our lives. We want to please God. We know, we know when you start studying this book, you know that we have to stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. And we have to answer for our life as a Christian. We don't get a free pass. We, we don't, in other words, we don't get a free pass to sin. God saved us from hell. We're not going to hell. We're not going to be tossed into the lake of fire. But we don't get a free pass to sin. We're still going to have to answer to Jesus Christ someday. We all are. If you've got sin in your life, get it repented now. Get it repented, get it forsaken, and get to your walk with the Lord. And maybe you won't have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says he's, he'll, he'll forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? We're supposed to answer for our life as a Christian, but maybe if we get repented now, it won't be so hard on us when we go there, to the judgment seat of Christ. Right? Get it repented. Get it out of your life now. Get it forgiven now, so you don't have to answer for your mistakes, present tense mistakes, when you get caught up at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Timothy 4.1, make sure you're living a life of Christ. Maybe you should make sure you're doing the ministry of reconciliation. Make sure you give out some gospel tracts here and there. 1 Timothy 4.1 I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Catch away the body of Christ, his appearing. He's not coming all the way down. He's just going to appear in the clouds and he's going to call us home. There's going to be a judgment. We're going to be judged. Oh no, no, I don't have to get judged anymore. I, I'm saved. There's still a judgment, brother, says Christ. Don't let anybody lie to you and deceive you. There's still a judgment. Okay. And the quick and the dead at his appearing. Remember, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which remain shall be caught up with them. And his kingdom, at the end of the, at the, the, end of the thousand year reign, Jesus lets Satan loose because he gets locked in the bottomless pit. He lets Satan loose for a while. The king, the... He, he gets nations to turn against him, then fire rains down, destroys the nations, destroys the earth, and now it's the great white throne. And they're all going to be standing there and being judged. Everyone gets judged. The Bible talks about how death and hell are cast in the lake of fire. But death and hell are brought up, they're judged by Jesus Christ, and then they're cast into the lake of fire. Romans 14.10 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You read a little bit more, there's hypocritical judgment that it's talking about. And it's talking about, hey, correct a brother in Christ. If he refuses to be corrected, let them alone. God will deal with them and get back to your walk with the Lord. You will also be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Judge yourself first before you judge someone else. Do I have this problem? Okay, and you're to have grace because we have problems, brothers of Christ. Not one of us is perfect. I know some men behind the camera like to, and the, the, the Bible buildings in the pulpit like to act like they're perfect, but they're not. They've got their own struggles and their failings that they do. They fail the Lord from time to time. They make mistakes. Okay? We're supposed to have grace when we judge our brothers and sisters of Christ and understanding that, hey, 
If he's newly saved, I was newly saved once and my life was a complete mess. They say they've been saved for a while. I've been saved for a while and there's times where I backslide. There's times where I make mistakes. There's times where I fail the Lord. I need to go into it in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Okay, but we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to be judged. Daniel 7.10 says, Daniel chapter 7 verse 10, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thou, thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. What's this talking about? Turn to Revelation chapter 20 verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. They're held accountable to the Levitical law. We aren't. We're held accountable to the blood of Jesus Christ. We're held accountable to Jesus Christ as one of his own at the judgment seat of Christ. But at the great white throne, they're going to be held accountable to the Levitical laws, the law of sin and death, and it's the works that are getting judged. And if they've failed so much as once, they're going to hell. They're going to, I'm sorry, they're going to be tossed into the lake of fire. But the point is, brothers and sisters Christ, we try to preach truth to the world, but if they don't want it, let them alone. If they don't want the truth, let them alone. We will all have to stand before Jesus Christ and be judged. Saved and lost are going to stand before Jesus Christ and be judged. We won't go to hell in the lake of fire. The lost will. But we will still suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. If you don't get those things repented and forsaken and get them out of your life and get back to serving the Lord and living for the Lord every day and making sure that this book has its proper place. Okay. We're wrapping this study up. Brother, Sister Christ, sorry for this being so long, but I really wanted to hammer at home what the, the importance of this book and our lives and to encourage you to look at every, all the points I made and there's some I didn't make that other brethren have made. That you're getting into this book and that you're studying this book and that you're living this book. Okay, You're hiding in your heart and you're living it. And this book is, taken, is still number one in your life, priority-wise. You start your day with this book, or you're ending your day with this book. Now, Brother Sister Christ, here's my encouragement. Sometimes, it's been a while, so I've been starting to go through some of the videos of the martyrs. What the cost was so we could have this book and hold it in our hands. What's the cost been? It cost people their lives. Okay. Um, please, I'll, I'll try to do a link down at the bottom. Uh, I put Peter Ruckman's The Final Authority of the King James Bible up. Okay, I know other brethren have theirs, uh, but so we'll start watching some videos again about the Bible version issue. Why the King James Bible is God's perfect written word as far as from a historical standpoint. Okay, I've shown you why by the scriptures and why it's so important because we already believe, but I had to go through and research the Bible version. I have other videos on the Bible version issue, but I also put Peter Ruckman's The Final Authority where he actually goes into it in great detail. There's still people that attack it, these uh, papists. I had the site that says, Pastor so-and-so, you guys need to stay away from the heresies of King James only. It's not King James only. See, that's the deception. It's that there's, we have a belief that there's a final authority and it's God's word and there's a perfect written word of God for today. And it comes in the form of the King James Bible for English-speaking people. But our belief is that there's a perfect written word of God. But they'll attack that, and they'll say, it's King James only. Uh, they just don't want it. But I have that video. Uh, Lamp in the Darkness is what I watched. The Untold History of the Bible. Right now I'm on Tears Among the Wheat. The sequel to The Lamp of the Darkness. Uh, you can watch some videos like the John Huss, where he started preaching the Word of God to the people in the common tongue, and he was burned at the stake for it. Uh, John Wycliffe tried to give the Bible, the Word of God, to the common people in a lang their language. Okay. He wasn't burned at the stake. God saved him from that. But later on, they dig up his body, and it's anathema. They burn his bones, and they're like, that's going to do anything. Uh, John Wycliffe is in heaven right now with our Lord and Savior. You can burn his, his bones all you want. Ain't going to do squat.
but that's the Catholic Church. Okay, flames in a wind is a good one to really open your eyes to, so you can really appreciate what the saints, the brothers and sisters of Christ, the church of the past had to go through so we could have this book in our hands. Okay, find a good story of William Tyndale and what happened to him. Okay, uh, Martin Luther, how he had to, he challenged and what he went through when he was challenging the Catholic Church in the world that didn't want God's Word out there in the common language. Okay? But mostly, Brother Sis Christ, some good teachings on the history of the Bible and some good testimonies on martyrs who put their life on the line so we can have God's perfect written Word today in our hands, the King James Bible. That helps you to have a great appreciation for this book, too, when you realize the blood that was shed so we could have this book. The hardship that's gone through. Okay. Take some time out in the next couple weeks. Make sure you're studying this book. Make sure you're reading this book every day. But take some time out to watch some videos on the history of the Bible. Uh, what, the, what the martyrs went through. 1 Timothy 6.3 3. 1 Timothy 6.3 When it comes to this study, I'm going to leave you with this. 1 Timothy 6.3 If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrines which is according to godliness, he is proud. You ever notice that when you have brethren that once stood for the truth, and they start steering away from the truth? Pride's always involved. Oh yeah. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. Brothers of Christ, this is my final authority. It's God's perfect written word in English, the King James Bible. I'm not letting it go. I'm hiding it in my heart. And when someone comes along and tries to get me to let go of this, be gone. Be gone. And then these last days, that's got to be your answer. Even if it's someone that once stood for this, was hardcore for this, and now they're becoming part of the falling away. Your attitude needs to be, if he's going to become part of the falling away, I'm not going to become part of the falling away. I'm going to stand for this book. And I have to withdraw, withdraw myself from that ministry. I have to withdraw myself from that brother or sister in Christ that's falling away from this book. They won't take correction. You withdraw yourself. This is the final authority. Okay, this is the final authority. You can have a brother or sister in Christ that once held this book in the highest place, but now has become part of the falling away. Do your best to exhort them with the scriptures, but when all is said and done, brothers and sisters in Christ, when all is said and done, if they choose the world... If they choose to stay in their fallen state and they choose to start going the way of the world, let them alone. What does Matthew 15, 14 say? Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. Let them alone. Or they're going to end up dragging you down with them. Stick to the Bible, brothers and Christ. Stick to the Word. There's an old hymn out there that I love. I'm going to try to sing it, but I've had a dry throat for this Bible study session. I'm sorry how long it's taken, but an old hymn that I like to sing from time to time, it's, um, I shall not be moved. But this is Christ. This is the water, you're the tree. This is the water. Remember that. And we're singing, okay? I shall not, shall not be moved. I shall not shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the waters i shall not be moved on my way to glory land and i'll not be moved on my way to glory land and i'll not be moved just like a tree planted by the waters I shall not be moved. Now Jesus is my Savior and I'll not be moved. 
Jesus is my savior and I'll not be moved just like a tree planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. Glory be to God and I'll not be moved. Glory be to God and I'll not be moved just like a tree planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. Brothers and sisters in Christ, are you being moved? Are you being talked out of your faith in this book? Is your flesh trying to get you away from this book? Covetousness, which is idolatry. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you don't have to turn here, but John 14, 14 says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 6, 63, we read again, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. And we started this study with Psalms 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. But there's this Christ. I want to end this with, please, please make sure that this Bible, once again, is taking the proper place in your life. That you're starting your days with this word. You're ending your days with this word. That's what it means to look for Jesus Christ. And what it means to look for that blessed hope. To have your eyes on Jesus Christ is to have your eyes on his word. Reading his word, hiding his word in your heart. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next part of this series.